Welcome to the Indian Ocean World Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Indian Ocean World Podcast. My name is Archishman Chaudhuri and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Indian Ocean World Center, McGill University. Today, our podcast features Professor Jenny Goldstein, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Global Development at Cornell University, USA. Professor Goldstein's research studies environmental conservation and development in the tropics, intersections of data infrastructure and land governance, human health impacts of ecological change, global food and agriculture systems, the financialization of land, and the role of scientific knowledge in climate change politics. She has published journal essays and book chapters on these issues. Of particular interest to Professor Goldstein is researching the development of plantation agriculture, especially oil palm plantations in the peatlands of Indonesia, a theme which she will discuss at length in today's podcast. So without much further ado, Professor Goldstein, welcome to our podcast and thank you for joining us. Hi, Archisman. It's really great to be here today. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Professor Goldstein. Um, would you mind uh, starting off by explaining how you got interested in studying the peatlands of Indonesia and the politics, as you have explained so cogently in your various research essays, the politics around climate change and the questions involving how governance and land grabbing allows sustenance of oil palm plantations in Indonesia? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it was a very circuitous route to, to get to studying peatlands in Indonesia. And I guess I can give you um, a bit of the long version, um, which goes back you know, to my undergraduate days uh, at Barnard College. And I, I had initially been really interested in landscape design um, and this idea of like how humans basically design landscapes. I was an architecture major. Um, and thought that the the sort of the design route was for me. But when I worked at a landscape architecture firm after college, I realized that I was much more interested in the history of why some of these landscapes came to be and the politics of them more than actually doing the design. Um, so I had applied to landscape architecture programs, but I withdrew my applications and started looking for, for more research, um, more sort of roots into the research. Uh, of that and ended up on geography. I, I sort of happened upon a geography website um, at UCLA um, and decided to apply to their PhD program. Admittedly, a little bit last minute, I didn't do extensive research on PhDs. I just sort of intuitively felt that geography captured all of my interests around the environment and environmental history and landscape and the sort of nature culture divide, um, as well as food systems, which I had gotten in, interested in personally. Um, as an undergraduate as well. And I realized the geography sort of captured all of that, right? There were people doing all of those different things. It was a very, it's a very big tent discipline. So I applied uh, to the program and I got in really without knowing too much about it. I still at the time I thought I was going to sort of study, um, you know, the histories of landscapes in Japan, which is where I had done my, my undergraduate research. And after my first year, I ended up um, getting really interested interested in this idea of taste and quality and commodity chains around like agricultural commodity production um, and went to Rwanda <laughs> uh, because one of my good friends from, from undergraduate was living there working for the Columbia University Earth Institute, which um, you might have heard of around the Millennium Village project. They're a sort of big development institute, especially in Africa. So she was working for them and invited me to come spend the summer there. So I ended up in Kigali for a summer uh, when I was doing my master's research, um, living with friends. Started, you know, I, I did my research interviewing coffee farmers that were working with a USAID program to improve the quality of their coffee beans and um, Rwandans who were based in Kigali, the capital, um, doing this taste work. So basically getting trained by American standards of coffee quality to taste for improvement, for quality improvement, and then partner with the US coffee buyers. So um, the Rwandan coffee beans would get higher prices in, in American markets. And you know, I found this, this to be a really 
fun way of doing research, right? Getting to hang out with coffee tasters and visit farms and sort of in a, in a way, it was a bit of a fly by the seat of my pants research, like just sort of following whatever lead and going through any open door available. Um, but when I came back and I was, I was writing this, um, you know, people started asking me, okay, you did a master's, so are you continuing to the PhD and are you going to continue to work in Rwanda? Um, and I remember one faculty member in my program said something like, um, you know, wherever you decide to do your PhD, you have to assume that you'll be married to that place for the next decade or longer, like you're entering into a marriage relationship. And um, as much as I, you know, enjoyed my time in Rwanda, I didn't really feel like that was the place for me. Um, you know, it's a very small country. I didn't um, necessarily want to be stuck working on coffee um, for the for the long term. And I think having spent time in Japan as an undergraduate really um, made me want to go back to Asia. I just sort of felt drawn to, to being somewhere in Asia. I've always loved Asia, Asia in general. I know it's an enormous part of the world, but um, I was sort of looking for places within Asia that would allow me to bring together my different interests, right? So I was increasingly interested, not just in food and agriculture and commodity markets, but in land use, um, which is one thing that had brought me back, uh, you know, to, to graduate study, drawing from that, you know, initial interest in landscape design. Um, you know, sort of, a, this was a time of really rising climate change politics around forest issues in the tropics, right? This was like around 2009, 2010. Um, I was increasingly interested in that and how carbon was getting valued as a sort of forest carbon commodity. Um, and on top of that, you know, at UCLA, they have a fantastic Southeast Asia program. Um, they teach all of the languages, same as Cornell. And I, um, by some sort of just I don't know, pragmatic slash serendipitous turn of events, ended up taking an Indonesian language course thinking, oh, wouldn't it be cool to go to Indonesia? They had the language on offer um, at UCLA. And a couple of the coffee buyers that I um, met in Rwanda had actually been talking to me about Indonesia when I was in Rwanda, because I think I had asked them questions along the lines of, you know, like, what else do you do in the rest of the world, right? Like, what other markets do you feel like you need to do this work in? And what countries do you find really interesting? And, you know, Latin America is obviously a very well-developed area um, for coffee production and quality, and it's very closely tied to U.S. markets already. Um, but several of them mentioned Indonesia, right? It's one of the largest coffee producers in the world. And they said, you know, it's a, it's a fascinating place. Um, there's not as much sort of entrenched poverty. This was sort of their description, entrenched poverty there as there is in, in the coffee growing regions in Africa, but there's still a lot of room to experiment with coffee quality improvement. So, you know, I had remembered that it's, it sort of piqued my interest plus taking the language um, made it accessible. And um, the other thing that actually played a, a real role in, in me going to Indonesia was, was Obama's first election in 2008, um, which in retrospect seems sort of crazy, but, you know, he had grown up uh, in Indonesia, right? His mother was a, an anthropologist um, who worked in Indonesia and, in part because of his connection there and in part because of the rising interest in Islamic countries, right? Indonesia is the largest um, Muslim country in the world um, by far actually. Uh, the State Department started devoting a lot of resources to Indonesia, right? To, to the study of it. They, they um, expanded language opportunities there, diplomatic opportunities. So in part, this was right at the time when I was getting interested in the place and taking the language. So there was a lot more money actually available to study Indonesia and far fewer scholars from the US working there, right? Than say, go to Latin America. Um, so it was kind of the, you know, this coalescence of all of these different factors made it possible. Um, this is not a necessarily a particularly, um, I think intellectually compelling story at this point, but it was a pragmatic one, right? And it it made it feel like, oh, it's possible for me to go to, to this country that I really previously didn't know anything about that's on the complete opposite side of the world, right? That's really enormous. I didn't know anyone there, um, but I went in 2010 to do a language program that was funded by the State Department. And, um, you know, that was really just dipping my toe in the water. I spent 10 weeks in East Java studying Indonesian and living with a, an 85 year old Javanese woman who cooked for me. Um, and after the, the language program ended, I went to Sulawesi, which is one of the, um, you know, sort of high end coffee commodity producing region, South Sulawesi in the country and um, met up with a coffee buyer there and some farmers. And it was a it's a beautiful part of the country. It's in the highlands. Um, the weather's relatively cool. It was very green at that time of year. Um, but I realized on that trip that I was a little bit tired of the coffee issues, right? Like it seemed like it was very similar to what I had done my master's on. I just didn't see the sort of long road of intellectual engagement around just studying coffee, right? And I didn't want to become like the coffee person. Like people were already starting to 
um, reach out to me because they were like, oh, we heard you're a coffee expert, right? And I was like, wait, I don't want to be a coffee expert. I want to be a geographer, <laughs> right? Um, so I, I kind of realized after that trip that I had to find a new topic, but I was I was really committed to Indonesia, right? And it, I think it was sort of that, you know, being willing to, to marry the place. I was like, well, I, you know, I don't know this place yet that well, but the language is accessible. Um, it's the country is so big that I could never get bored here, right? If one place becomes kind of boring or if, if it becomes inaccessible, there's so many other parts of the country I could go to. There's so many environmental issues. They're very complicated. Um, and on top of that, I just liked it, right? I like the food. I love the people there. Um, you know, it's a very hot and humid climate, but I kind of like that. Um, so yeah, it, it, all of those things really just fell into place. And I, uh, I guess as, as some people get married, right, you have to just sort of dive in blindly, not knowing everything you're committing to, <laughs> which is what I did with Indonesia. I definitely didn't know everything I was committing to, but um, I committed anyway and, you know, kept going with the language. And um, and then the following year, I went back for a longer sort of preliminary research trip to to figure out what my, my dissertation topic would be. And that's when I, I got interested in the peatlands. So that was in 2011. I was uh, living with... Um, some scholars who were working at the, the Center for International um, Forestry, C4, which is outside of, of Jakarta. And um, again, at the time, you know, everybody was sort of talking about and working on RED, uh, this UN program um, reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation, right, which is a carbon offset program to pay countries like Indonesia to, you know, stop deforestation as a way of maintaining carbon stocks. And one of the scientists at C4 that I was talking to, I think was the first one to mention the peatlands to me. And she said something that I still remember about how, why she was so fascinated by peatlands. You know, she was describing these fires that burn underground and they're so mysterious and, you know, they'll burn underground and they'll smolder and they'll pop up somewhere else. And she said something like, oh, it's like watching a flower bloom and all of these bees are just sort of attracted to this flower. And that's how I think of this fire issue in the peatlands. And it sounded kind of wacky at the time, but I, you know, I started looking up these fires and um, I've always been interested in the subterranean sort of as a, as a landscape. And sure enough, like, yeah, there were these subterranean fires and I didn't, you know, I couldn't find that much information about them, but it was an attractive, um, it was an attractive topic, like a seed to try to follow, right? One of those sort of intellectual seeds that you come across and you're like, I don't know, this intuitively feels like something I should follow. Um, and then around that same time, another scientist at C4 told me um, about the mega rice project um, in, in Borneo in central Kalimantan province. And he was describing it in the context of a red project that was happening there um, around you know, 2010, 2011. And he was doing sort of data collection on how successful red was in that area. And I, you know, I stopped him. I remember we were stuck in traffic you know, outside Jakarta for a very long commute home, probably an hour and a half, right? And he's sort of talking about red and he, he mentions the mega rice project. And I said, wait, that sounds fascinating. I wanna hear about the mega rice project. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm actually less interested in red. Um, and he said, oh, well, you know, it was this project that President Suharto designed in the 90s to try to cultivate rice in the peatlands, but the project failed. It was Javanese style rice that was not well suited to that peatland, you know, ecosystem. Um, and it just sounded really fascinating to me. Again, it kind of brought together all of these things that I had been interested in for a long time. Um, you know, both this idea of, of trying to participate in a, in a regional and global food system, right? This idea of producing rice for the country, um, failed development. You know, I, I had read, you know, James Scott seeing like a state and this just struck me as one of the prime examples of an attempt at a sort of high modernist development project. Um, and then on top of that, you know, people were talking about it as a, as a severely degraded landscape, right? And this idea of a degraded landscape was really interesting to me. Um, because I think of my, my background in landscape architecture, right? What landscape architects often do, um, you know, if they're working at a, a sort of urban scale or something beyond a residential scale is take a degraded landscape, right? They take an unused landscape or um, something that has not really been cultivated or a brownfield um, or some sort of wasteland, right? This idea of wasted land and they turn it into something, right? Something usable by people or something beautiful. Um, so I've been interested, I think, all along around this idea of restoration, around landscape restoration and what happens to landscapes once they become really degraded, right? And it, you know, it strikes me that a lot of people lose interest in them. 
right? A lot of scientists don't want to study degraded landscapes. Once the forest is gone, they move elsewhere um, because, you know, the, still the dominant scientific paradigms are around studying intact ecosystems, right? And looking for places to conserve, places that have, you know, solid biodiversity, um, like the objects of study that most scientists are interested in, right? And these degraded landscapes, like the site of the mega rice project, right, where the they deforested around a million hectares of forest, um, although some of the forest is still there. They drained these peatlands, right, which are swamps. Um, they The peatlands started burning in the 1990s, and they've burned sort of on a cycle almost near annually ever since. Um, it, you know, it's it's captivating in some ways because a lot of people don't want to pay attention to those places. Um, you know, and I was encountering people when I first started paying attention to that landscape, even before I went there, scientists who said, oh, why would you want to go there? It's a pit. You know, there's nothing there. Like, if you want to study tropical forests, you should go to a part of Kalimantan where they still have tropical forests, right? There's a lot of um, orangutan conservationists who work in that area. Uh, it's one of the largest, um, central Kalimantan is one of the, the largest orangutan populations in Indonesia. And, you know, the orangutan conservationists were like, oh, why would you want to go there, right? It's such a, such a terrible place. Like the orangutans can barely survive there anymore, right? And I'm like, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not interested in just orangutans. I'm interested in this sort of bigger questions around, you know, the political economy, like what happened to this place. And even if the causes of the landscape degradation are, um, at least on the surface, relatively straightforward, um, it's not at all clear what happens afterwards, right? And it, it, it also, I think, became very clear once I, I finally went to this place in 2013 that this is by no means an abandoned landscape, right, in the way that um, I think a lot of scientists would assume or um, even a lot of politicians, right, Lo like local state officials that might say, oh, we're not going to do anything there anymore um, because it's sort of an abandoned wasteland. Um, but actually, the, the history of wastelands in Indonesia and in India, right, are, it, they, they are often very attractive places for new sorts of development, right? They can become a kind of blank slate for new types of investment, or people see them as these sort of conflict-free, easy lands to, to take advantage of or to grab. Um, the perception that they're not really inhabited, right, makes them increasingly attractive. Um, and, you know, it feeds right into a sort of overarching development discourse around, um, you know, land that basically needs to be developed, right? It needs investment, it needs development, it needs to contribute something, it needs to become useful and productive. Um, and that's exactly what was starting to happen in this, you know, million hectare burning peat swamp, right? It was like, it was right around that time, around 2012, 2013, becoming increasingly um, relevant, not for food production anymore, but for carbon sequestration, right? Because the global narrative had shifted away from just food security and rice production to, okay, climate change is now the dominant sort of environmental problem facing everyone. And, you know, these landscapes are important because not only are they able to potentially sequester or take carbon out of the atmosphere, but they're producing so much carbon, right, through these fires and through oxidation, which is what happens through peatland degradation. So the whole sort of, you know, I think it was this really pivotal time of um, of a sort of shifting rhetoric around development too that made this has made this project sort of continuously interesting to me is, is the different development discourses that have been embedded in this single site, right, over time, like from sort of food production and, and Indonesia wanting to claim um, food self-sufficiency, right, which is a sort of ongoing rhetoric. I think that, that my interest in the Mega Rice Project um, has, you know, expanded beyond it just being a single site of sort of development failure um, into how it's become a sort of ongoing, um, in some ways, a, a catalyst for different development, development discourses in the country, but also this kind of vacuum, right? I think a lot of people see these, these so-called wastelands or degraded lands as a blank slate, right, for pursuing new projects. Um, one of the first times I heard that actually was from someone who worked at the World Bank. Um, I was uh, meeting with them in Jakarta and we went to some sort of, uh, you know, NGO happy hour and I was sort of tagging along with him and he mentioned um, something about oil palm and I said, oh, is the World Bank pursuing, you know, oil palm production in Indonesia? And he said, you know, very adamantly, he said, we're only pursuing oil palm production on degraded land, right? That is the World Bank policy. And, you know, it was again, one of those sort of like red light moments of, wow, that's really interesting, right? Like degraded land, right? What is it? Who gets to define it? Um, where is that? 
like, is it degraded to everybody, right? Why does the World Bank get to decide what land is degraded, right? And all of a sudden, you know, that is fine for production, but other land isn't. So um, I think, you know, the degraded land in Indonesia and is, is really a, um, this kind of vehicle, right, for understanding these different development discourses from food production to something like oil palm to what became really popular in the um, sort of late 2010s and is still increasingly popular, right, which is around investment for climate change mitigation, which is what's been happening there now, right, trying to prevent um, ongoing carbon um, emissions from this degraded landscape um, and, yeah, kind of and, and value them for that purpose, right? So in a lot of ways, there's these competing valuations going on in the same site. Um, it's a big place, right, a million hectares, but the visions for what's possible there and for what value it can produce, both for, for locals, right, for local inhabitants versus what it can produce for the province or for the national government versus what value it has to, right, the global community in terms of preventing carbon emissions. Um, for the global atmospheres, you know, those things are often in competition, right, in the single site. So that's kind of the overarching, I guess, um, description of the book project I'm now working on to bring together all of this research, right, that I've been doing now since 20, 2011, um, that I, you know, started for my dissertation and have, have tried to keep up. It's hard now during COVID, but hopefully I'll be able to go back there next year. Thank you, Professor Goldstein. Uh, may I now ask you to briefly explain what is essentially peat and what are peatlands? Yeah, that's a great question. Okay, so peatlands, yeah, so wherever they're found in the world, uh, peatlands, you know, follow the same principle, right, which is partially decomposed vegetation material um, that doesn't fully decompose for a, a variety of, of climatic reasons. And um, most people know of peat bogs, right? I often get asked if I work in peat bogs, but bogs technically refer to peatlands that are mostly comprised of mosses, like very mm. small plants that you would find in very cold climates. Um, and of course, the tropics doesn't really have mosses, right? They have huge trees and lots of shrubs and big, you know, big plants, right, that end up sort of falling over um, getting buried mostly underwater, right, because these areas have a ton of rainfall. And once they're lying underwater, um, they're not able to decompose, right? Because there's not enough oxygen. So they end up getting buried. And over, you know, tens of thousands of years, this material basically just sits submerged and it gets sort of buried under more vegetation. And some of it decomposes, but not all of it. And it's, it's waterlogged, right? So what you end up with in Indonesia are these, um, you know, basically buried vegetation material. It could be anything from, from fully undecomposed logs, branches, leaves, um, all of this material that goes back tens of thousands of years and it can be up to 20 meters deep, right? So really, really deep. Um, and, you know, if the, if the forests are still standing and the swamps haven't been drained, then they're, they're swamps, right? It's, it's very muddy. Um, if you try to walk through them, you can end up very quickly waist deep in water, which I've done, which is sort of a um, fun experience, I guess, if you get into it, but quite messy. And, and these places are, are kind of difficult to access, right? You have to take boats through them. Um, yeah, so that's what, that's what peat is. And what happens in Indonesia with the degraded peat is that uh, to make these lands usable, right, for large scale agriculture or to take the trees out, which have been very valuable um, over time, you have to drain the water, right? It's all, it's all about hydrological control in the, in the peatlands, not just deforestation. So, um, you know, over time, they've developed a system of digging canals, very large canals, any, anything from small canals to get single trees out to large canals, you know, built by bulldozers. And once you're able to channel the water right in any sort of wetland, um, the, the rest of the area becomes drained. And if it's drained enough, right, and the surface isn't flooded, then it's accessible, right? You can more easily take out those trees, you can plant things. Um, but it's still, it's a very hard land to, to, to use, right? Because a lot of crops don't, you know, the soils are pretty poor, they're very acidic, they don't have a lot of nutrients in them. This is not the sort of fertile soil you find, um, the volcanic soils like in other parts of Indonesia in Java or Bali, right, which are known for the sort of beautiful rice terraces and tropical fruits and things like that. Like the peatlands don't have, um, while there's a lot of species diversity, right, they don't historically have a lot of those sort of crops that people, um, you know, find edible or, or useful in that sense. So, you know, it's been a, an ongoing process to figure out what commercial crops will thrive in these peatlands. And 
Um, you know, oil palm does very well in these strange peatlands because it's a relatively tolerant crop in general. It's quite hardy, which is one reason why it's become so popular. Um, it can tolerate some amount of flooding. Um, so, you know, once you've drained the peatlands, you have to do a lot of hydrological management to keep the water table, which is basically just the level of water underground at the right level, right? If the water level is too high, then the roots of the plant will flood. And if it's too low, then you can end up with, you know, subsidence, soil subsidence, um, fire risk, things like that. So one thing that the, the oil palm plantations throughout Indonesia and Malaysia have gotten quite good at is managing the subterranean water water table, right, to maintain sort of oil palm production. Um, but if you do lose, you know, a lot of your water table or it drops too low, then you end up with these huge fires that Indonesia has um, experienced over the past, you know, two decades or so periodically. Um, and if, if the water table is too high, right, it floods your crops, right, and, and the land is unusable in that sense. Um, and on top of that, you know, these landscapes often require um, high amounts of fertilizer input, pesticides, um, you know, sort of uh, expensive commercial inputs that a capital intensive production system is able to provide. Um, in terms of what smallholders are able to do in the area, um, I have seen a lot of rice production, even though there's a lot of, I think, um, assumptions that you can't grow rice in peatlands. That's really not true, right? The, the truth is you can't grow wet style, right, wet paddy, Javanese style rice in the peatlands. You can grow um, what in Kalimantan they call paddy gunun or mountain rice, which is dry rice, right? So it's not irrigated um, except by, by rainfall. Um, and it looks very, um, you know, it almost looks haphazard or disorganized, right, if you see it for the first time, because unlike in say, it's not planted in very neat and tidy paddies, like, you know, very composed, you know, meticulously handled uh, sort of squares um, that you'd see in Java or Bali, but it's it's planted sort of randomly on burnt, post burned landscapes that receive rain, right? And in between logs and stumps and things like that. But people are able to grow certain species of rice in, in the Kalimantan peatlands, um, but not to a commercial sort of productive level. It's usually enough to feed their own family or maybe sell some at the market. So. You know, in, in that sense, the, the original intention of growing rice to supply, you know, the Indonesian population failed, right? Because you just can't produce rice at scale um, that they were hoping for in these sorts of, you know, drained peatlands. But um, the peatlands themselves can support, um, you know, quite a number of inhabitants living, you know, growing kind of production for themselves on smaller plots of land closer to the rivers where the soils are, are more fertile. Um, and, and people who've lived there for a long time have very diverse livelihoods, right? So they rarely invest in a single crop or a single sort of production mode. They often rely, you know, during the year on, on different sorts of livelihood styles, right? So it might be growing rice, it might be um, some logging, it might be some rubber trees that they have in one area. Maybe they have a few oil palm, you know, oil palm palms to, to harvest, um, some other vegetables, right, non-timber forest products. Um, the indigenous people who live there have typically preferred, um, right, to have these sorts of diverse livelihoods for obvious reasons, right? It's a much safer bet um, that you're not going to lose, you know, your entire livelihood if one crop fails, for example. But that's seen as sort of developmentally unproductive, right? That's not the developmental aim of the government, um, which is to promote, you know, sedentary agriculture, capital intensive agriculture, things like that, which have, you know, in some ways really struggled in some of these degraded areas. And in other ways, I would say, have, have succeeded in doing what the state has intended them to do, right? Which is, you know, I think expand oil palm, right? It's a, it's a booming crop. It's continuing to be a booming crop. Um, and getting a lot of sort of foreign investment for that. Thank you, Professor Goldstein. Um, that was quite interesting. Uh, you have provided us with quite illuminating insights on how the Indonesian government and its development projects have introduced sort of uh, subsistence agriculture to peatlands. May I now branch off a bit in, in a bit of different direction and ask you a few questions based on your research, which I have had the chance to read. Uh, you argue that the scientific literature on developing peatlands is quite divided. For instance, uh, you have made this point that oil palm plantations in Indonesia are controlled by corporate magnates who are based in Malaysia and Singapore, 
And since the Indonesian state decentralized a lot of uh, political decision making in the 2000s, many transactions that are related to oil palm plantation concessions are completed outside official regulations. And a lot of power is vested with the district authorities, which are keen to extract rent on natural resources. This, as you have pointed out, has resulted in an expansion of oil palm plantations across the Indonesian peatlands. While the scientific community has showed in its research that exploitation of Indonesia's peatlands for palm oil emits carbon into the atmosphere, research which in turn is funded by oil palm industry magnets and which is often not published in peer-reviewed journals, as you have pointed out, is used for political ends by arguing that carbon emissions from Indonesian peatlands are lesser than what is projected and scientists and industrialists can efficiently manage the emission of carbon from Indonesian peatlands. So far as I understand, these two phenomena clearly feed into each other. Could you elaborate on this uh, for our listeners, please? Yeah, I think, um, Archisman, you've provided a really nice synopsis of, of one of the sort of papers that I published. Um, I can say that I think, you know, to sort of summarize even further that the, the competing scientific interests are very much analogous to the competing development pressures, right, from these, sing these single types of landscapes. Um, and they, in fact, developed out of, I think, those competing development pressures, right? Going back to what I was saying before about these different interests around, um, I think, legitimate uh, concerns for the Indonesian state, right? Of, you know, they, they want economic growth, they want continued food production, um, they want to be able to use the resources that they have, which are very rich, right, for their own you know, their own country's benefit. That is sort of one of the hallmarks of state sovereignty, right? Being able to territorialize your own, your own natural resources and use them as you wish for economic or political objectives. Um, and that competes with the sort of now global developmental pressure around, you know, mitigating climate change, right? And the pressure that the global community has now put on Indonesia to conserve their tropical forests that are left and to rehabilitate and restore some of these peatlands that are emitting carbon on an ongoing basis. Um, and that's sort of the dilemma that the country is caught in, right? And I, I'm sympathetic to that at, at a sort of macro scale in that I think that's something that, you know, the world in general is dealing with, right? Like how do we continue to, to feed people? How do we use land productively? But how do we also, you know, scale back our resource use? How do we, you know, take carbon out of the atmosphere while preventing further carbon emissions? Indonesia is dealing with all of those things, right? Um, and that really gets distilled into some of these debates around, um, how effective industry is using peatlands and whether they're able to do some of that carbon mitigation themselves. Um, and I, I will say that, you know, having science as a, a sort of political mechanism is not limited to Indonesia, of course. What I, what I describe around the Indonesian context is something you might find quite similarly around, um, you know, agriculture and biotechnology in the United States, right? So large agri, you know, agriculture companies that you know, pay scientists to, to do research that supports, say, the ongoing use of pesticides or the ongoing use of fertilizers or the insertion of, you know, GMO technology into, into monocrop landscapes in the United States, right? Like all of that, um, all of those interventions, right, need to be supported with some type of scientific knowledge, right, to legitimate them. Um, and these big companies do that everywhere in the world, right? They do it in Africa, they do it in the United States, right? They do it in Europe. Uh, what these companies do in terms of, of trying to legitimate their practices through science is, is very common, right? It's a global phenomenon right now. Um, and that's exactly what the, the Malaysian, particularly Malaysian oil palm companies have done. So it's important to know in Indonesia that, you know, as you mentioned, Archisman, that the much of the oil palm um, plantations in Indonesia 
which are actually controlled by Malaysian-based companies or Singaporean-based companies. Um, and a lot of this research, I'm really building on fabulous research done by my colleague, Helen Avarki, who is at the University of Malaya in Malaysia. Um, she's Malaysian herself, right? She's got great access to, to the state there and to scientists there. And she's really done all of that work to unpack the sort of patronage politics that goes on in Indonesia and Malaysia and all of the lobbying that goes on on the part of oil palm companies to continue to support right oil palm cultivation across millions of hectares. Um, and this isn't even getting into the sort of labor issues. There's other, many other, you know, there's a lot of other great work around labor and oil palm, but from a, the sort of more environmental side, you know, the scientific research that these scientists are doing is basically showing that you know, exactly that, that the oil palm companies can manage carbon as a risk, right, in the way that they manage their hydrological systems. So as I was describing that the, you know, oil palm companies um, and plantation managers have to manage water table levels, right, they have to manage the hydrological system to make sure that the oil palm doesn't get flooded. They're now saying that they can do the same thing with carbon, right, by maintaining water levels at a certain um, distance from the surface, for example, they'll say, well, if the water table is high enough, then um, you know, the soil is not releasing carbon. So we're actually managing it better than, you know, better than this plantation would be managed if it were just abandoned, then it would release even more carbon. Um, and this gets into some pretty sticky sort of debates because in some respects, abandoned land has been shown to produce more carbon than land under oil palm production. And in part that's because, um, you know, scrub brush will will quickly, you know, grow on abandoned land or land that's not being intensively managed. And if there is a fire that comes through, right, that soil will will ignite very quickly um, and start to burn, right, if the water tables aren't managed. So so there is some some truth to that, that story, right, around oil palm companies doing a better job of managing lands than abandoned lands. Um, but it's not just about management, right? It's not just like, well, we're gonna, we're gonna prevent more carbon than abandoned land would. It's like, well, what can you do with that land if it's not under production, but it's being deliberately used for something else, right? And that's where the alternative sort of story around from the scientists comes in, which is, you know, the more sort of Western scientists, foreign scientists and their Indonesian collaborators um, have done a lot of work to say, well, you know, it might be true that the, you know, oil palm plantations are producing less carbon emissions than an abandoned land in the same area. But if we start to rehabilitate that hydrological system and actually repair the land, then we can reverse the carbon emissions altogether, right? And start to take them out of the atmosphere instead. Um, and that idea is really threatening, right? It's threatening to an entire industry that has, um, you know, been cultivating tens of millions of hectares of peatland over the last 20 or 30 years. And uh, that's also very threatening to, to Indonesia and Malaysian governments, right, that have relied pretty heavily on the GDP um, that's brought in from oil palm. Um, and again, I think we get into really difficult, you know, sort of debates here around development versus climate of, you know, should Indonesia and Malaysia, should they not be allowed to develop resources that the rest of the world has has developed, right? Because there's no global pressure to, um, you know, to, to have carbon emissions and carbon, to have climate change mitigation as the, the sort of leading edge that drives development decisions, right? Or should they be sort of trying to protect their own interests? Um, now, I don't mean to be saying that oil palm plantations serve all of the citizens of Indonesia or Malaysia well, right? Like these are not necessarily production regimes that um, provide great livelihoods for many of the people involved. Um, you know, much, much of the product of, of oil palm, the, the palm oil itself uh, is not directly edible, right? It needs a lot of processing to, you know, get incorporated into mostly junk foods, right? Or highly processed foods that's not you know, they're not extremely nutritious. Um, some of it does go into to biofuel, um, but not, not a lot of it. Most of it's still used in edible products, but processed foods um, and in cooking oil, right? So a lot of it gets exported to China or to India as cooking oil. Um, so in some ways, it's become a, a really integral part of, of the food and agricultural systems, particularly within Asia, um, which I think is something a lot of people outside of Asia don't really appreciate. Um, you know, over the, the years, there's been a lot of sort of interest in boycotting palm oil, um, right, for their environmental practices. And, and most of that's driven by, you know, European organizations or American, you know, environmental organizations. And I just have never really believed that, you know, a boycott from Europe or America is going to affect, 
um, you know, the politics of, of oil palm in, in Southeast Asia, because there's so many state policies that support the production. And there are so many consumers outside of America and, and Europe, right? Like we are not really the dominant consumers of a lot of this palm oil. Like the, most of the consumers are, you know, the billions of people in China who rely on rely on it for cooking oil. Um, and, and many people throughout Southeast Asia, right? In India who, who use it for cooking oil and it's become just entrenched in that food system um, in a way that it really wasn't. Um, you know, 30 years ago when coconut oil was much more prevalent. So it's hard to find a replacement for that type of crop, right, that gets really entrenched into these food systems. Uh, well, thank you, Professor Goldstein. That was, uh, that was really fascinating. Uh, may, I, may I ask you a different question now? And this is more related to what kind of environmental hazards a sustained cultivation uh, of uh, sustained cultivation on the peatlands in Indonesia could lead to. For instance, I'd been reading a few reports on the tsunami that struck Sulawesi in 2018, and one of the reports suggested that the tsunami was partly caused by a landslide uh, along the um, along the seabed. And as you have pointed out in your research. A majority of the oil palm cultivation across peatlands has happened in low-lying coastal areas across Sumatra, Borneo. So is there any possibility or is there any risk towards uh, sustained oil palm cultivation leading to environmental hazards like the tsunami, which, of course, has threatened and hit Indonesia in the past as well? Yeah, so Indonesia has a lot of natural disasters, doesn't it? Like, I understand where your question's coming from in the sense that, um, you know, you know, Indonesia sits on the ring of fire, right? They've got volcanoes and earthquakes and tsunamis, um, you know, not a lot of cyclone action, but they're not immune to that either. Uh, heat waves, droughts, right? Flooding this year, 2020 has seen some of the worst flooding in Indonesia. Indonesia. Um, so I understand the, the interest in trying to connect the dots here, right, between like environmental degradation in one place and some of these disasters. Um, but to my knowledge, I think um, those things are not really connected, right? And for, I think, two primary reasons. Uh, this is not really the thrust of my research, but I can just say that um, First of all, the peatlands are geographically distinct from some of the natural disaster phenomenon that you're describing, right? So the tsunamis that Indonesia has experienced back in, you know, 2004, the famous tsunami that hit Su uh, Sumatra, northern Sumatra, very hard, um, and the one in 2018 that was caused by a sort of sliding undersea um, landslide, right, that ended up hitting Sulawesi. Um, Kalimantan, the place that I've been talking about, the peatlands, uh, they face the inland sea of Indonesia, right? So the Java Sea. So that area of Indonesia is not really susceptible to the type of Indian Ocean tsunami that Sumatra experienced, first of all. Um, Kalimantan actually rarely has earthquakes because they're not directly on a fault line. They're sort of outside of the multiple fault lines that, that crisscross Indonesia. So there's not much risk from a direct earthquake or something triggering an earthquake in that region. Um, and that's true for the peatlands in Sumatra as well. Like they're on the eastern coastal side of Sumatra that faces Singapore, which is again, not directly on a fault line and not exposed to the Indian Ocean. Um, so there's a bit of sort of geographic nuance there, right? That I think is important to, to identify that, you know, when you're looking at the region from a distance, it starts to seem like, oh, everything could happen anywhere at any time. But Indonesia is a huge country, right? It's it's um, geographically as, as wide as North America. It's about 3,000 miles east to west. Um, and, you know, some places are prone to different types of disasters than others. So I think in addition to having that sort of geographic distance, um, the, the peatlands are not really at risk of being exposed to those sorts of disasters, but your question about triggering, right, a natural disaster, I would say is also um, not quite on in the sense that geologically peatlands are above the, the geological layer where earthquakes occur, right? So earthquakes tend to be quite deep, right? Like a couple miles, four miles down, five miles down, right? Peatlands go maybe 20, 25 meters, Right, so we're talking about sort of different strata of the, of the geology, of the Earth's geology, in the sense that um, 
to do something like to trigger an earthquake, you have to be drilling down really far. So things that trigger earthquakes would be, right, drilling for natural gas, um, right, maybe deep well drilling, mining, things like that, like things that actually penetrate the geological sort of layers, right? The peatland is is interesting in the sense that it's deeper than just a typical soil layer, right? Like soil is usually a meter, two meters. Um, peatlands, again, they can go 20, 25 meters deep. So it could be considered a geological layer. There's often rocks there, right? But it's sort of this in-between zone, right? It's not the rock layers, but it's not just the earth's surface. So things that happen in the peatlands and those top layers of peat are not really, um, to my knowledge, again, I'm not, you know, I'm not a geologist, but they're not really at risk of triggering something like a deep earthquake. Um, so, you know, to answer your question, I would say that, that in that respect, there's not much overlap, right, between degradation in peatlands and these sorts of other other natural disasters that Indonesia is is very vulnerable to. But um, but there's certainly other other sorts of environmental hazards in the area, right? So flooding would be one of them. I think the peatlands are increasingly vulnerable to flooding. Um, one of the things that happens with peatland degradation as a phenomena is that over time, the the top layer of peat actually, you know, it oxidizes away into the atmosphere. So through microbial oxidation, it's continuously releasing carbon emissions, carbon dioxide, and um, that process is basically eating away at the soil, right? You could imagine it's sort of turning the, the physical matter into atmospheric, you know, kind of gases. And over time, right, and fire does the same thing, just at a much faster rate, the, that peat layer actually, it, it disappears, right? It doesn't disappear from the earth, but it goes into the atmosphere and it's no longer sort of physical substrate on the surface. Um, and once that starts to happen, you know, you lose that peat layer and you're just left with the water table. So over time, um, and this is starting to happen in some areas, but scientists, scientists project that it's going to, you know, speed up and increasingly happen in other parts of Indonesia is that you, you lose land mass, not just from sea level rise, but because of land subsidence. Um, and then you're just left with flooded sea, sea you know, seawater that, um, you know, is, is not just at right at the current coastline, but it's actually further inland and eventually that will merge with rising sea levels elsewhere and Indonesia will actually be losing a lot of their, their coastline to that flooding phenomenon. Um, you know, and even before that happens on a large scale, certainly lots of people who have smaller plots of land will experience flooding, you know, for a longer period of time throughout the year, that land becomes unusable. People might start to wonder whether they should continue to, to plant it the rest of the time, um, you know, risks land abandonment in some respects, right, people searching for land elsewhere. So flooding certainly has a lot of sort of environmental spinoff effects, I think, that we're just beginning to understand um, related to migration. Um, but even not necessarily, right, just livelihood alternatives, people looking to, to plant things that might be more sort of saltwater tolerant, things like that. So I think in, in my mind, you know, peatland degradation would probably most be connected to flooding as an environmental hazard. Um, and of course, to the fires, right, which I've mentioned, which is really a massive human health threat um, across Southeast Asia. So, yeah, luckily, those are the only two, right, only two natural hazards. You don't have to worry about earthquakes or <laughs> tsunamis in the peatlands, at least not right, not right now, not volcanoes either. Those are in a different place too. Thank you, Professor Goldstein, for clarifying uh, a point which I had made. And thank you so much for a wonderful lecture. That's all we have got time for today. A special word of thanks to my colleague, Rennie Mandeville, who worked behind the scenes and produced this podcast. And Professor Goldstein, once again, thank you so much. I'm sure our listeners are going to enjoy all that you have discussed and shared with us today. Your fascinating journey from North America via almost halfway across the globe to Indonesia. And then uh, I'm really excited to see how your book shapes out and I look forward to reading it. Once again, my name is Archishman Jaudhuri, and you have been listening to the Indian Ocean World podcast. The Indian Ocean World podcast would like to acknowledge the generous support of the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. This podcast series is part of the SSHRC-funded partnership project Appraising Risk Past and Present, interrogating historical data to enhance understanding of environmental crises in the Indian Ocean world.